But today we're going to be talking more about proteins. Actually, we're going to focus this, 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 this chapter, chapter 4 is on proteins, and even the bulk of chapter 5, since it's dealing with enzymes, we're talking about predominantly from a protein perspective. <clears throat> All right. So the thing of it is, is let's say that you have, you want to do research on a specific protein, or you need to get a specific protein out of a cell. There are thousands upon thousands and thousands of different proteins in a single cell, and so you have to be able to purify it. Even if you have it overexpressed, where you've cloned it into, say, like E. coli or yeast or SF9 cells or something like that, you still have to be able to purify it to get it rid, to get it away from all the other proteins, and also to get it rid of all the other cellular debris and, and everything <coughs> with, that, with that respect. All right, so to summarize here, within that single cell, there are so many proteins. You know, it depends, and the protein composition depends from cell to cell. And so to study that single protein that you need to, that you need, that you're wanting to study, or that perhaps that's what's causing the disease state, you have to try to obtain as homogeneous a sample as possible. And so before you can even characterize it, you have to isolate it from everything else. So there's different techniques that we're going to talk about and go into detail about. And then we'll also talk about how to, um, we'll finish that by talking about how to sequence the proteins. Like if it's a protein that you don't know what the sequence is for the amino acids. So the term homogenization means that you literally are breaking the protein, uh, the cells open to homogenize it. You're going to mix it all up. Okay, you got to break them open in order to get the proteins <coughs> out. Now, if it's a membrane protein, it's a little bit more tricky because then you may have to use detergents in order to isolate it from the lipids in the membrane. And then we'll talk a little bit about ways to do homogenization. In particular, we're going to talk a little bit about sonication because we actually have a sonicator in the biochemistry lab, freeze thaw, and some of the other techniques as well. So these are just some of the examples. There's like the brute force from like the mortar and pestle of the old days, especially if you're doing something with like plant cells or things like that, that they would just take the mortar and pestle. There's the good old blender, the wearing blender, where they would literally blend up this stuff. But does anyone know what the, the thing on the right is? What's that right there? That's a sonicator. What do you suppose a sonicator uses? Sound waves. And so essentially it's like shock waves. This one's actually a really thick sonicator, but you can get tips that go all the way down to where they can fit inside a little epidural tube. And so what it does is it vibrates, because sound waves are just vibrations, it vibrates at such high frequencies that it literally will cause the cells to burst open. Okay. And so now in the lab that I was in and did research in it in my... In, in my undergrad days, we just did it out in the open. You know, we just hold it. And I mean, it makes this high piercing sound, um, which is not good. So but I can blame some of my hearing loss on that, I think. But uh, we actually, then when I got to grad school and everything, we had little, little like soundproof boxes. And we have one of those in the lab. And so the one problem, what's one problem with using sound, well, homogenization just in general, but especially using the sound waves, what do you suppose is going to, what else will it generate besides breaking open the cells? It generates lots and lots of heat. You don't want to do that. Why don't, why don't you want to heat the little bacteria or yeast up too much? You're going to denature the proteins and denature things that you don't want to. And so we actually usually do this in ice, and it generates a lot of, a lot of heat. It'll melt ice. <coughs> but it's, it's really cool. So hopefully we'll get to use it. <coughs> okay. Once you, oh, and that's not the only one. I thought I had other pictures, but... Some of the other ways that you can do, use is just sheer force. And so by that, for example, you can use what's called a French press, which I've used a French press before. I don't like it nearly as well as sonication. What, what's a French press? Like some people may know about this with, with coffee nowadays, but... I can't do it, do it justice, but it's literally where you've got your bacteria in the media that's been growing in that you want to get the 
or yeast, but usually it uses bacteria. And they've got this thing that kind of looks like a piston. Like it's a big beaker, metal beaker looking thing. But in the bottom of it is a really, really tiny little hole. Whoops, I can't even do it with that. Just a little hole. Here, let me use a different color. There we go. It comes up. All right. And so what happens is you literally pour your solution into that container. And then there's something, there's a receptacle underneath that's going to collect it. And then the piston comes down. That's why it's called the press. And it presses it down and it forces everything to that little tiny hole. And by doing that through brute force, it causes the bacteria to literally squish each other open. Okay, and so because you just have to have all that pressure down, it too generates lots of heat, and so you have to be careful <coughs> for the foaming. And you usually have to do multiple passes. So it's called the French press. Now the one that's really cool is, and it's got, it's also got a great name. That's the homogenizer, which those are really expensive. <coughs> And this works for both yeast and bacteria. And it just looks like a big box. So we had a homogenizer in the last slide. Well, actually, the last two times I worked at. Um, at Michigan, I should say. And what it does is inside the box, it's just got a pump on one side. That's like what you would, you know, you put your, your beaker, your flask of bacteria on one side. You stick the little tube in it, and it's going to suck the... Um, the solution into the big box, but inside the box, you know, you've got your beaker here, whatever, but inside this box, essentially, it's like a labyrinth, for lack of a better word, there's all these twists and turns, sort of like a roller coaster, and what happens is it sucks it through, and then there's a receptacle, you know, you put another beaker here on ice once again, where the stuff is going to pour into, but what happens is it sucks it through at such a high pressure and such a high velocity that the little bacteria gets banged up between the curves and the sides of the walls and everything inside the box, that little maze. And so it literally, they burst themselves open. And so, and it goes really fast. And so whereas this French press, you know, you, you take so much pressure that you, you kind of go slow. The sonicator, you have to do multiple cycles, usually with one to two passes uh, through the homogenizer, they're broken open. Okay, because they just literally ran over themselves and crushed themselves open. Yeah. <coughs> Would they ever, like, uh, reseal themselves? Or once they pop Not, no, no, I mean, no, I mean, literally, I mean, you have just busted them open. It's not like you pierced them, like a micro-injection, like you busted them open, and so they won't, it's not like T2 or anything like that. So, but, and then there's <laughs> another one called the bead beater, which is just like it sounds, what you do is you put your solution in with a bunch of usually glass beads have to be chemically inert in a little container and it just takes it back and forth to where the beads beat the, the yeast or the bacteria open. That one's a little bit, they also generate tea, but it's a little harder to keep it cool. Um, but it reminds me of the paint mixers, like at Lowe's. It's essentially the same thing. Um, but those are very, very loud. And I've only used those like once, but the homogenizer is really cool because it just sounds like a little pump, boop, 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 you know. But it, and it's really fast. Okay, but after you've broken all the cells open, now you're going to use centrifugation in order to separate the different components. Because you want to get the lipids away from everything else. You want to get you know, the different organelles. <laughs> Sometimes you want the, maybe you want the proteins from the organelle. Maybe you want to keep the mitochondria out. So, for example, we were specifically at different times working on different mitochondrial proteins. So you want to separate the mitochondria from the rest of the cells and so on and so forth. So... What happens is you use centrifugation in order to separate everything out. Which I don't know if this blows up in no. So I'll just take you through it. This is a little different, but um there we go. They're showing something similar to the mortar and pestle, just to break it all open, but the in the important thing here is they, they, they centrifuge it. And so if, when you centrifuge it at different speeds, different things go to the bottom. Because, you know, whenever you centrifuge, the stuff will start to solidify or come out. And so one of the very first, at really low speeds, 
it's any unbroken cells, nucle the, nu the nuclei, like the various nucleus, the, not nucleuses, but the nuclei from it will be, that's the first stuff that will start to precipitate out. So then you can pour that solution off. It's called the supernatant to the solution. Put it into another centrifuge tube. Spin at a little bit higher speed. And then you get some of the other things that are, some of the other organelles will come out next, like the mitochondria, lysosomes, various things like that. Then what you do is you spin at a very, very high speed, and you'll start to get the ribosomes. Some of your proteins will start to come out. But then anything that's soluble, your lipids will come out. Anything that's soluble will be left in the supernatant. But sometimes you actually, I'll tell you right now, we used to just not do the different speeds. We would just always put it at the high speed and just get everything else out until we would have the, what we called the lipid layer, which would be stuck at the bottom and then the supernatant. And if your protein was soluble, it would be in the supernatant. If it wasn't soluble, it would be stuck in the lipid stuff. And so then it makes it a little bit more tricky because you've got to try to get it away from the lipids. Since that means it doesn't like water, you can't just add like a regular buffer to it. You have to add detergents. Then you have to have some way to know and be able to see your proteins. How do you know which, <coughs> which part of the supernatant, which supernatant solution that your protein is? And so one way to do that is through spec spectrophotometry. You can also use electrophoresis. But if you just take a protein, a cell, it's called lysate. That's whenever you first break it open. It's called lysate. And because you lysed it, lysis, so it's called the lysate, that, you, it's just going to look like a big smear. Because there are so many proteins and different things that will show up whenever you try to do an electrophoresis that it doesn't tell you a whole lot. But it does, we usually keep a little sample of that as a reference to show that at each step of our purification that we got better, better, better and better resolution, better separation. Scientific term for that is a resolution. Okay, but one way that's nice with proteins and amino acids for that matter, um, or so, some amino acids, is spectrophotometry, because some of them, they absorb light at different wavelengths. Just like DNA and RNA absorb lights right around 260 nanometers, You'll find out that tryptophans and tyrosines in particular absorb light around 280 nanometers. So you can follow along where the proteins are that way as well. Okay? So spectrophotometry is just usually, many times we refer to it, you, you think of like the UV vis or visible light spectrophotometry. That's like the color metric stuff you probably did in like Gen Chem where <laughs> you put the colored solution in the big spec 20 and then, you know, the little needle would go up and down or whatever to show you the absorbance, how much light was absorbed. But in reality, spectrophotometry can be of anything throughout the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So, for example, with radio waves, it's NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, IR is another type. That's IR spectroscopy or spectrophotometry. You have the UV vis, which is visible light or the UV light and so on and so forth. You can technically do like different things with like x-rays and EPR and things like that. But what you're looking at is you, at different wavelengths, you can pick up different things. And for proteins, typically we're talking about things in the UV vis. So you can just use a normal spectrophotometer. Okay. So the common one is, of course, you always have to have a blank. That's to zero out any background absorbance. But the common method that's used for proteins is called the Bradford. It uses a dye called Kumasi Blue. It is similar to the dye that they use to stain the gels. And you just, the amount of protein, it stains proteins in particular, and the amount of dye present is going to be within limits, within certain limits, it will be um, directly proportional to how much protein you have there. Now, a way to separate the different proteins. So now you've got a solution that's got lots and lots and lots and lots of proteins. You have to have ways to separate it. And we're going to talk about column <coughs> chromatography. This is perhaps the most common way that it works. Okay. And so it's a little bit of a misnomer because it's the, the term chromatography comes from color. And not all proteins, in fact, many proteins are not colorful, but... The original, whenever they first started doing separation techniques, they were doing different dyes, you know, separating out the pigments from plants and things like that, so that's why they got the word chromatography. But there are some proteins that are 
colorful too. But all of that means is that you're going to use the physical properties, physical or chemical properties of the proteins and how they differ from each other in order to separate them one from another. <coughs> and there are different types of chrom column chromatography. All of the all types of chromatography has to have at least two phases, which we've done this in organic chemistry. And for those of you currently in organic chemistry, it's next week's lab. So we're going to be doing chromatography. But you always have to have, there are different, two different phases. One phase is the mobile phase, which is the one that moves, hence the reason why it's called the mobile phase. And the second one is the stationary phase, which is the one that does not move. And so with a column chromatography, it's really easy to pick up which one's the mobile versus which one is the stationary. The stationary phase is the one that makes up the column. It's whatever the resin or beads or whatever it is that you put inside the column, they're not moving. Whereas the mobile phase is the liquid that goes through. Okay. And you can change out what resin or beads that you're using in order to make up the column. And I do expect you to be able to use logic in order to figure out like which proteins would elute first or which ones would come, and elute means come off the column, flow through the column, and which ones would elute last based off of their physical properties. Okay. <coughs> All right. So the whole idea, as I mentioned, the mobile phase is it's called the eluent because it elutes from the, from the column. <clears throat> um, the whole idea is that based off of their chemical or physical properties, some of them is going to like the stationary phase better than the mobile phase. And so they're going to stay in the column longer. Whereas if it doesn't like the stationary phase very well, it's going to stay with the mobile phase longer or, or more easily and it'll come off the column first. So that's why we can either separate things based off of size or charge. Those are the two easy ones. And you can also do other types of what's called affinity photography, <coughs> which I'll go through some specific examples of that in a moment. For example, like the HIST tag or the GST tag and MIC tag and things like that. Those are the ones that are tags. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. This is just a little cartoon showing this. Of course, they've colored it right now. But the whole idea is you've got some type of stationary phase inside the column. It doesn't move. You've added a solution that has multiple proteins or multiple things in it. And then as time, either just due to gravity pulling it down, or you can put it on either low pressure or high pressure to, make, to force it to go through. Um, the solution is going to start to, to be eluded. Anything that really likes that column, whatever that column is made of, is going to stay in the column longer. So whatever that color is. It really likes it, whereas this color doesn't have a high affinity for the column material, and so it's going to come off first. The beginning is called the initial flow through because it's the <coughs> part that flows through initially, so it's really, really simple. Usually you have to wash your column because you've got to rinse it all off to get it into the same buffer system that you've got your proteins in. Okay, Because you don't want to cause like some type of shock by all of a sudden sticking the protein material on something that's completely different because they could precipitate out or become denatured or something like that. So you usually just wash it really well with whatever buffer you're using that's compatible, presumably. And then you load your sample on and that initial part that just comes through, that first volume is called initial flow through. Because there may be some stuff that doesn't stick at all. And so if it didn't stick at all, that means that cone didn't, wasn't good for using with that sample. <clears throat> Then, you, you usually, in order to get the last stuff off, you have to be changing your buffer, either through a gradient or by what we call step or batch. Some of the things that you can use to change it with <coughs> is like pH, because right? pH can change binding affinities. Some things, as we talked about this last class or two, where once they, if they gain a hydrogen, they either become neutral or positively charged. Or if they lose a hydrogen, they either are now neutral, went from negative to neutral, or from neutral to, which I say gain or lose. <laughs> so if they gained a proton, they either went from they, they're either now neutral or they're positively charged. And if they lose a the proton, then they're either now neutral or they're negatively charged. 
So that's why you can play around with pH. Another one that's often probably used the most is ionic strength, which is a really fancy way of saying, what are you adding? If we do, that's supposed to be an A, so just ran off the screen. Like, how do you increase ionic strength? What do you add? <coughs> you have ions, which are more commonly called salt. You just increase salt concentration, because that's increasing the amount of ions that are there. Or you can sometimes use some type of competitor. That's true for the ones that are binding. Something that'll compete with the protein that's stuck, and they'll bump it off like little bumper cars. Because the other one, and there's some, once in a while you'll find something that likes the column so well that you essentially can never get it off. And that's, if that's your protein that you're wanting, then that's really bad because there's nothing you can do, essentially. So those are things that you would add to the stationary you, physical? Well, I mean, you, well, you add it to the buffer flowing through, and it forces the stuff off the stationary phase. Okay. And I mean, Hopefully it'll help make sense once I once we go through some specific examples of columns in just a moment. This is just a little cartoon to show how the different colors get <coughs> muted. Okay, one of the very first types that we're going to talk about is called size exclusion. Sometimes it's also called gel filtration chromatography. These use either beads or it can use some type of like agarose or agar material where you make pores. Now, this one people usually get backwards. This one's a little confusing because it's size exclusion. And this was the best picture of the time that I could find online to try to explain it. <coughs> but what happens here <coughs> with size exclusion here we go, is you've got your column and you got proteins of different sizes. Now, the nice thing about size exclusion is since you're not changing the ionic strength, you're not changing the pH or anything like that, you don't have to worry so much about denaturing your proteins just because you're changing the conditions of the buffer. So you don't have to change your buffer at all. But I'm going to, this is not drawn to scale, but a lot of times these are made up of beads. And so let's say that this is a bead. The beads really are really tiny. But these bees are sort of like Swiss cheese to where there's little holes all through them. Then what happens is as, let's see. So you've got proteins of different sizes. But what it is, is if it's a big protein, it can't fit in the holes inside that bead, and so it's excluded, hence the name size exclusion. So it just goes around. And so the big proteins, this color was big proteins, the big proteins just go right on through. That's what they're trying to say right there with the large molecules. It goes around the bead. Whereas if you have a little protein, one that can fit inside the holes, I don't know if this color will show up. You got a little protein, it actually can fit and go in and out, in and out of the holes, and it does that for all the beads, and so it takes a lot longer. So the things, they elute according to size, and the bigger it is, the faster it comes off. So the big things elute first, small things elute last. And you can buy beads or materials that have different sized holes based off of whatever the putative size of your protein is. <coughs> so this works really well if your protein is small because then you can buy a bead that say that cuts off at 10,000 kilo, uh, 10, daltons, 10 kilodaltons. So anything that's beyond 10 kilodaltons just goes right on through. Or, or, it should, or it should say it goes on through much more quickly than anything 10,000 Daltons or less gets stuck and takes a lot, a lot longer because it can fit through more of the holes. And they have different cutoffs. And you usually, when you're purifying proteins, you usually have to do more than one purification method. This may be one. Maybe you first want to run a size exclusion. Then you take the one that has your sample in it, and it's still not perfectly clean, and so you run another type of column like one of the ones that we'll talk about in a moment, and that will help purify it even better. And they do what they call a purification profile or a lucian profile. Or they, but you're just trying to make as pure a sample as possible in your protein. And at each step, you're going to lose a little bit. Because each time you try to purify it, you know, it's not 100%. Um, just like when you do an organic synthesis, you know, the more steps that you have in your synthesis, the lower your percent yield is going to be overall. Same thing here. 
the more steps you add to your purification, it may become more and more pure. However, at some point in time, it's no longer very efficient. Okay, but that's size exclusion. <laughs> Once again, for size exclusion slash gel filtration, the bigger it is, then the the um, the shorter or the the time it stays in the column. Now, if you use an agarose, it's the opposite. So that's just like a gel. Then, if you're using that, what happens then? If we're using some type of agarose, I'll show you what. Let me go that. This time I'll use this color. So now we've got a gel-like material in here, but it's. This is supposed to be like a little polymer matrix. <clears throat> it's the opposite. Like if it's poly, if it's some type of like a polyacrylamide or an agarose kind of thing, then you can imagine it just being the opposite because this essentially is the same thing as gel electrophoresis. And so then what happens here is the small proteins, which I'll put in this color, the small proteins can fit through the matrix really easy and they come off first. Whereas the larger proteins, they struggle. It takes them a lot longer to get through the column. Okay? And so that's why they, it would take them much longer to come off than the small ones that can wiggle through the hole. So it's like the analogy that I used to like to use was like the crowded subway at you know, rush hour. And when I was in Caracas, like when you hear that dinging at the doors, you better be inside fully because they, they, they don't stop for anybody. So if you're tiny, you can fit through and wiggle through the crowd a lot easier than you can if you're a large person. <clears throat> so that's why it really matters on what they're making up. Usually what the material's making up. Whenever they say size exclusion, they're almost, I mean, I've never heard of them referred to size exclusion with respect to a gel material. Um, size exclusion is talking about like the beads. <coughs> and so then the big things come off first, the little things come off last. Whereas if they're using an actual gel that's got a matrix to it, that's cross-linked, then it's going to be the opposite. Okay, let's put that now in words. So that's why it, it's going to separate molecules based on size, like I mentioned before. They can either be trapped or they just pass right on through. All right, <clears throat> and so this is just another one showing, another cartoon showing the same type of thing. So then what happens is this is the elution profile where they've used spectroscopy most likely afterwards to see, and you can see it does separate based off of si uh, size quite well. And so whenever you do this and you're running your samples, a lot of times you try to hook your column up Either some of the NICE systems are automatically hooked up to a spectrophotometer, so it's constantly taking for every sample, it automatically will take the, the reading of how much protein that there is. But the old-fashioned way, which also works, is that you collect them in tubes and you just put a little bit of the sample in from each tube and you check to see what the UV vis says of it. But you, you have to be able to tell. And so, for example, here, if we were looking for the small molecule, we would take the samples from this section to this section. You'd pull them together, and we would take all of this right here, put that in another beaker or whatever to go into the next purification method. And then we've effectively gotten rid of all of this contaminating stuff, plus anything that came off earlier, which they don't show here. But that's why it's already relatively pure. But perhaps we're wanting something that's right we don't know it, but we know maybe it's just this part right here. But we just we haven't we've got to be able to separate it out even better. So you do another method. So affinity chromatography really is a broad category. Because what are some of the affinities that you can have? Pardon? You can have polar and nonpolar. That's a great one. Mm -hmm. So if you put you know, if you put a column material that is nonpolar, the polar stuff's going to go right on through, right? And the nonpolar stuff will get stuck. And so to get it off, then you're going to have to have a, add more detergents or something in order to fight it off. Um, 
So that, that's, that's good. Um, or vice versa. You can have a polar column and then add a more nonpolar solvent, uh, not solvent, the uh, solution, and then it would be the opposite. So there's polar and nonpolar. What else is there? It's similar to that, but it's even more extreme than polar and nonpolar. Well, that's that's on the same that's the same thing, hydrophobic, hydrophobic. What about like even more basic than that? Pun intended. Acids make well plus and minus, right? You could have some <coughs> proteins have more of a positive charge overall. Some's going to have more of a negative charge, and so that's why that's like the at the extreme. And those are called cation and, and anion exchange. Okay. Um, then you could have, well, pH is really just a type of, of, of ion exchange. You can also have it to where they deliberately clone a tag. They call it a tag. For example, like the MYC gene onto it, onto your protein on one end. And then what happens is you just have the antibody that's stuck to the bead. And so then those work really well. The um, tag gets stuck to the bead. Everything else goes on through. Then the problem is you got to try to get it off. And as you know, if you've taken immunology or just you know, uh, some of your biology classes, the binding affinities for those are almost impossible. So you have to have some way to get it off. And usually what they do is they put a protease site in between the tag and your actual protein. So then they just add the protease and it cuts it off and then it then you've got your protein. The only problem is you've got your protein and you've got a protease. And so that's why you've got to then somehow separate the protease from the protein. Okay, and then there's one called the his tag, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. But let's just go through in a, some examples here of these. So for example, if we do, well, sometimes people get the, and once again, this is not trying to scale. I'm just making it really big so I can draw exaggerated beads. This is your column and we've got a bead. And covalently attached to this bead is some type of linker that has a positive charge. Okay. What kind of proteins, and of course that entire column is that way, I'm just showing one bead, but what kind of proteins will have a high binding affinity for that kind of column? Negatively charged. Negatively charged, and those are called well, I mean, is that a cation or an anion if they're negatively charged? Anion. anion. So your protein, which is negatively charged, is going to want to be bind. Or the ones, and the one, and the more negatively charged it is, the tighter it's going to bind. The way that you would get this, and then anything that was neutral or more positively charged would come off almost immediately. And then you can even separate out those that are just slightly negatively charged versus really negatively charged. And the way you do that is you increase the ionic strength. So as the ionic strength, usually they just use sodium chloride, I mean, literally salt, like table salt. Um, sometimes they'll use potassium chloride if whatever protein that you're using, um, you know, has something, you know, wrong with sodium or, or, or vice versa. But so if you're using sodium chloride and you keep adding more and more sodium chloride to try to fight the proteins off, what part of the sodium with chloride is actually fighting and going to bump the protein off. The chloride. The chloride's a negative one. And so what happens is at some point in time, there's so many chloride ions around that it's going to literally kick off that protein and exchange its place. That's why if it's a positively charged column, it's called an anion exchanger. Sometimes people get it mixed up. And it's because they're exchanging anions. <coughs> so the more negative proteins will bind, and you have to kick it off with, with, by increasing the amount of chloride, usually chloride anions or sulfate or something like that. But usually you want to use chloride. <coughs> Just because it's cheap, and it's also usually um, more stable. Like proteins can usually handle it better. Like sulfate sometimes precipitates out at a lower concentration than chloride does. At some point in time, you add enough salt, it's called salting out, and it actually cause all the proteins to fall. In fact, one protein that I was trying to purify, that's how they would purify it initially, is they would just add salt to it, and they knew at what concentration of salt that it would start to precipitate out, and that's how that they would try to get it out first. But that doesn't always work. Whereas, if you have another column... And by the way, a lot of those cation, anion exchangers, 
they end with an amine. It would be something like polyethylene amine or something like that because the amines are positively charged, and so that's why negative charges will bind to it. Yeah? Is there a possibility that that Um, usually, you're doing this under ionic strengths. I mean, there's always that possibility, but usually you're doing it at ionic strengths that are conducive for your protein. It is true. If you got to a certain ionic strength, it could be nature. That's why, if you don't know why, if you don't know anything about what protein you're using, you actually, it's just trial and error. You try lots of different methods, and you see which ones work best. Okay, and that's why, if you ever read papers where they talk about purification of proteins, I mean, a lot of times they use two or three different columns, and it take, it, you, you can actually publish just publish a paper just based off of how you purify your protein. And so what you do, though, is if you're using a gradient, like if you have a really nice chromatography unit where it uses a gradient, where it just slowly increases the salt concentration, then chances are you won't denature it because it's going to get that perfect place to where this, the protein will just come right off. Whereas if you're doing it the batch and step method where it's first you add in 100 millimolar salt and then you add in 200 and 300 and 400 like in batches, then it could be that you overshot it and stuff. That stuff happens. That, that does happen. But it's quicker and cheaper because those that have the automatic mixture ingredients, I mean, those cost lots and lots of money. Okay. So then we have the opposite. So this one was the anion exchanger. Like I said, usually it's some type of amine, since amines are bases that tend to typically are positively charged. This one has a negative ion at the end. And so what kind of proteins are going to want to bind to it? The ones that are more positive. So it binds. Once again... <coughs> What do you suppose, now we bound our proteins to it, the other stuff is fault, the ones that were more negatively charged or neutral it would go through. So what do you suppose that we can use to compete it off? Usually it's sodium chloride, but now it's this sodium or potassium that's the competitor, the competitor, the competitor, competitor, I'm going to make up new words. So then once again, at some point in time, you get enough sodium around that it's going to bite your protein and bump it off. Okay, and so what kind of exchanger do you suppose this one is? This is the cation. Okay, so those are two types of affinity, anion exchange, cation exchange. But nowadays there's one that gets used that, I mean, our labs used to use it all the time. Um, because it didn't require antibodies. Like I said, you could put something, some type of antigen attached to it. But first of all, let me just show what I mean by that. <coughs> Let's say that, you, you, first of all, you would have to already have your protein cloned, right? You've already been able to separate it, find out what gene it makes, and clone it in order to put an antigen on it. And so then whenever you're making your gene, what it's going to look like is it's going to have either the N-terminus or C-terminus, whatever the antigen, for example, maybe it's MYC, or, I mean, there, there's lots of them out there. But there's some type of antigen there. You have to have another little linking area and then the gene for your protein. So this is what we're wanting. And then, of course, <coughs> the rest of the plasmid or the chromosome or whatever it is that's your, 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 usually it's plasmid or cosmid. But in between the, the here and here, you need to put in some type of protease spot what are proteases? They're enzymes, because ASE is an ending for an enzyme. Okay. Like OSC is the ending for what kind of, it's a sugar. Like dextrose, glucose, what ASE is, is the ending that well, like enzymes get. Um, but what are proteases? They break apart proteins, okay? And they, they can be very specific for different, after different amino acids, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later on. But you have to be careful because whatever protease spot you put in there, it better not cut your protein too. Otherwise, it's no good. And so that's why, and then not only that, but at the end when you're purifying it, you're going to have, your protein's going to be pretty pure, except it's going to have the protease along with it. So then you've got to separate the protease from the, the <coughs> protein. But that is another type of affinity column because then the MYC part, before you add the protease, it binds to its, its antibody. And it binds really well, so then you can just wash everything else off, and then you have to add in a protease to cut it. 
and then somehow separate the protease from the protein. So that's another type of affinity. But the his tag is the one that I was wanting to talk about because that one gets used all the time. What do you suppose the his stands for? Histidine. And once again, you, you clone it. This is, you can't do this from, like if it's a protein that you're trying to purify initially for the first time, you can't do this. This is after you've been able to figure out the gene and clone the gene into like E. coli or something like that. Because what you do is either at the N terminus or the C terminus, once again, you put it what's called a his tag. And that his tag usually has anywhere from 6 to 12 histidines in a row. I'm just going to put it at his 6. Okay. Which, what's, the charge, what's the charge on histidines? They, they tend to be positively charged, right? Because they're the ones that are... Oh, whoops, no. Where's that? And then you've got, I'm showing this on the N terminus, but it could be on the C terminus. Then you've got your protein of cho choice. Of course, what you do is you have the E. coli, or the yeast, or whatever you're using, usually E. coli, make lots and lots and lots of the protein. But it made this protein with the histidines attached to it. So now we've got our protein. You know, it's folded, presumably. And then at the end of it, we've got this his tag. So there's a whole bunch of histidines. I'm just going to make it that color. Histidines have a special property when there's a lot of them in a row. Even though they're positively charged, they really like to bind metal, and particularly like to bind two metals. They bind nickel in the 2-plus state and chromium, okay, especially chromium 3-plus, but chromium 2-plus or 3-plus. They bind chromium even better than nickel, but chromium is more expensive. And so you... I mean, there's just a special affinity that they really, really like to bind nickel. And so now your column, <coughs> you buy, they, they even call them his beads, but they're not made of histidine. Or they'll say a his tag column. You got, you got, your column still has a bead, but now it's got a nickel that is attached to a linker or a chromium that's attached to a linker. So all the proteins go through, but your his tag protein binds much better than anything else, even at relatively low ionic strengths. And so it's going to bind really well. I can't draw it in there, but um, I'll just make the yellow part. So you got your protein. It's bound. So there it is. It's stuck to the nickel. But then you have to get it off. And so once again, here you're wanting to find something that competes, that will compete. And you don't want to use salt. Okay. Because first of all, it's difficult to get it off with salt. And secondly, you'd, if you had to go to such high concentrations, then it would actually could denature your protein. So what could you compete a his tag off with? Now hydrogen. I mean, if it's histidine that's binding to it, then you're going to compete it with... It makes sense with more histidine. Well, in particular, rather than histidine, you just compete it with the imidazole. Imidazole ring is that ring part of histidine. So this one, it uses imidazole. And imidazole is just... Remember, histidine is, looks, looks like home plate with the two nickel... Not nickels, two nitrogens. That's like imidazole. Right? So it looks essentially just like, and so you increase, you just add imidazole, higher concentrations of imidazole, and it will bump your protein off. Okay? And so it works really well. So many times this can make it relatively pure. So maybe this is a second step. Maybe it's, sometimes we would do this as a first step or a second step. Maybe we did a size exclusion just to get rid of a lot of the big stuff, and then we did like a his column. Um, his tag column in order just to purify it, pro and then it, then it was done. Okay, and so it's just a specific tag. There's another one called the flag tag, and there are other things like that. But these, these, those are just all special affinity columns. So now, just for the words. And so here, it's specific binding of the protein to something. There's a polymer that's usually stuck to a bead that has whatever that ligand, ligand is what binds, it's, it's the word that we use in endomology all the time, and that other proteins don't have an affinity to it. 
And then you have to add high concentrations of whatever that ligand is in soluble form to knock it off. So that's why if it's an anion exchanger, you have to add more <coughs> chloride. If it's a cation exchanger, you add more sodium. Of course, you can't just add sodium alone and sodium chloride. Um, if it's something that's specific, like histidine, like the histone, then you add an imidazole. And then if it's an antibody, then you can't add more of it because it's already bound. But you have to make sure you have a protease that comes and cuts it off. So, okay. Are there any questions?